As uh, many of you may know, uh, Chris Crump has served as Senior Director of Sales and Marketing for Comrex for quite a while now, since 2004. And uh, goodness, what a, what a CV here. ABC Cap Cities, Detroit, um, uh, Media Base Research, Monday Morning Replay. Uh, you've been doing on-air, remote broadcast engineering, creative services, capital broadcasting, Ron and Ron Radio Network. Uh, and that's all before 1996. And so he's been with Spectral, Bufonics, Symmetric, Klotz, Digital. Remember Klotz? <laughs> and Crump is uh, talking to us uh, from uh, Buford, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. And uh, he is... Uh, uh, going to talk to us about WebRTC today, uh, something that I think is going to benefit everybody and the Opal. So I'm going to mute all the microphones for background issues. And Chris, you unmute yourself, please. Uh, you will also have access to the screen. And uh, please uh, turn it over to you. Well, just uh, in on a red eye from Los Angeles, or just the night before, I had uh, dinner with Richard Rudman and a bunch of other great broadcast engineers from the LA area. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces and, and names as well. And uh, happy to be here, uh, Barry, and thanks for the opportunity. So um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is something called WebRTC. And just out of curiosity, Show of hands, how many people have heard of WebRTC? So I see a few. Um, the crazy thing about WebRTC is it's actually being utilized by a lot of applications today, and we're going to kind of go over some of those. And you'll probably be surprised, those of you who aren't familiar with it, how many things it's actually being used in. Um, and I'd like to switch over to the dreaded PowerPoint now because we all have to have PowerPoints in our lives, don't we? Uh, let's go ahead and boot into that, and I'm going to share this with you. So, yeah, there it is. WebRTC. Is it really the future of communications? Oops, I'm losing my place on the screen here. Let's do this. Why is this doing this for me? Okay, let's do that. Okay. Okay. So, um, WebRTC, I usually like to give kind of a Comrex um, timeline of, of history, if I can get the PowerPoint to work correctly here. Kind of where we fit into the whole picture, starting with Alexander Graham Bell in 1876 when he patented the uh, audio telegraph um, in, in, to, in terms of now. So Alexander Graham Bell, basically like any great technology, that whole thing was not without contention because someone else kind of challenged his patent for the uh, audio telegraph. But basically his technology revolutionized the world going from just a uh, Morse code on a wired telegraph to actually being able to send audio over a fairly widely deployed infrastructure of copper around the country uh, following railroad tracks all over the US. Um, as we got into the development of that technology, um, probably in the um, early 2000s, we went beyond just being able to place audio calls over, over the lines. We got into the ability to uh, com uh, digitize, compress, and send that as serialized data across the circuit switch telephone network. So we'd been living on that widely deployed circuit switch telephone network all over the planet for communications with things like frequency extenders, um, which we kind of helped uh, develop in the early 80s um, through the 90s, and then into uh, using modem technology to get audio across into higher bandwidth with uh, the hotline POTS codec. And around 1983, Al Gore invented the internet and everything changed. Well, okay, he did not invent the internet. I realize that, I understand, but he did sponsor really important legislation, which led to um, ARPANET, DARPA and ARPANET, and um, the term that not he, but one of his staffers coined, the information superhighway, which has really become the world's most largely deployed, widely deployed uh, network infrastructure for communications. 
So about um, early 2000s, we started to actually experiment with sending audio over IP, and we've developed a whole line of IP audio codecs, as have others. Um, but about 2010, there was a new technology that popped its head up called WebRTC. And we'll talk a little bit about where that came from. About 2010, there was a company called Global IP Solutions that was working on a way for browser-to-browser -browser communication to occur. And Google thought that was interesting, so they bought the company. Uh, they presented the technology to the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force and also the World Wide Web Consortium and decided to release it as an open source project. I would think that the reason they did that was because they realized that they weren't the only web browser out there. They realized that they needed to have some cooperation with companies like Microsoft, Apple, uh, Mozilla, Zeif, and some of the other companies in order to make this really uh, a technology that would uh, work for the world community. In 2011, Ericsson Labs out of Sweden did the first implementation of something that they called Bowser, which was a mobile web browser that did some really rudimentary form of WebRTC, web browser to web browser communication. So shortly thereafter, um, Google kind of pushed forward some development and actually used the Google Chrome browser to make the first browser to browser video call without using an app installed on each machine. It was literally a peer-to-peer -peer connection between the browsers. After that, they were able to do um, a tr data transfer, sh uh, screen sharing, and so forth. And they were doing some implementation with their uh, Google Hangouts app um, that was utilizing WebRTC. Um, Hangouts is now chat, which is really kind of annoying because I've just gotten used to using Hangouts for everything. And now I have to change. I hate change. It's really annoying. Uh, about to, uh, 2017, we introduced our first WebRTC product. And between 2014 and 2017, we noticed that there were all of these um, WebRTC conferences and seminars happening. And our development team really kind of latched on to the idea of being able to utilize all of these endpoints that are in the web browsers. But the challenge for us was, how do you interface that with the broadcast side of the equation. You need to have professional audio connectors. You have to have reliable transport. It needs to be broadcast quality and broadcast reliable. So we attended all of these really boring uh, developer conferences for WebRTC, uh, learned about the technology and developed uh, what we call Opal, which is our first um, WebRTC product. And we released a stable version of it in 2018. So the really important part of the whole WebRTC equation was making sure that all of these companies were on board in the open source project. So when you look at the names of these companies, you've got Google, you've got Apple, you've got Zyph, which is the parent company of Mozilla, Opera, many other browser companies, kind of hard to imagine that they all work together on this, especially since Microsoft had Skype that they had acquired, and it seemed like it was going to be competitive with them. But luckily there were some uh, forward-thinking people that really decided that this was going to be really good for the entire industry, and they started to work on this project together and implement it in their web browsers. So WebRTC is a couple of things. First of all, it's an audio engine, and that audio engine uses the G.722 and Opus audio coding algorithms, and we'll talk about Opus in just a minute. It uses a couple of video encoders, VP8 and H.264 for HD quality video. And then there is a data engine, which is commonly used for text messaging, but also screen share and um, data transfer and file transfer between uh, web browsers. So essentially what happens with something like this is you have an application that is uh, built into the web browser, and then a little line of JavaScript will wake up the engine that you've specified for this particular uh, application, whether it's just voice or it's video and voice, or it's just a, a little text engine. Once that happens, um, there's some communication that's happening between the endpoints, between the browsers, utilizing STUN, uh, simple traversal under utilities for networks, uh, to basically get through nets and firewalls. And importantly, there is a SSL certificate exchange on TCP, uh, TCP port 
443 to make sure that it's a secure connection between the two. A lot of times that's done through a third party uh, browser or a browser that's specified or a uh, uh, SSL server that's uh, specified. The other thing that happens is it's going to ask for permission to utilize the media on your device, whether it's the uh, microphone or the video camera or both. And then once all of that communication has taken place, there's a peer-to-peer -peer connection that takes place between the browsers. And then the WebRTC server, the intermediary, manages the calls. One of the really good examples of uh, this being utilized, and you've probably seen this uh, on various websites you visit, um, either it's a shopping website or it's a, a product website for something you're interested in. Uh, a good example of this is, is uh, something that we've put on to the Comrex website. If you go to Comrex.com, you'll notice in the lower right-hand corner, if you have a supported browser, um, there's a little telephone icon in blue with a white telephone and a blue button. If you click on it, it brings up a little menu that will allow you to make a voice or a video call to someone who's standing by. Um, and then once you click on that button, it will either connect to myself or to Raul Hun, who'd be glad to speak to you in Spanish. And you have the option of doing the audio or video call. And we can talk to you about products. We can help you out with tech support. Um, and it's a really nice little WebRTC application that was developed by uh, one of our um, uh, SIP provider, voice over IP providers on SIP out of New York. And the application is called Say So. And on our side, it's just a little line of script that we put into our uh, web browser or into the, uh, the web um, uh, URL info. And when that pops up, it's already there and it's talking to a server to, to manage that. And it's actually worked really well for our customers and for us. So beyond that, essentially to develop a, a WebRTC application, um, you can go to a third party company. If you have some really good developers, they can do that for you uh, because there is an open source WebRTC applications program or interface um, that basically will allow you to tie in the things that you wanna utilize uh, such as media capture, encoding of audio and video. Um, and once you have that built into your web browser, um, the communication involving the transport layer and session management is all built in. If you're familiar with uh, the SIP protocol and how that works, if you look over on the right-hand side of the screen there, you'll kind of see how that communication uh, happens. It's a little less chatty than, than SIP, but it's really about connecting peer A to peer B with that signaling server in between and then reaching out to the third party services for um, ice, stun, turn, the things that will get you through firewalls and nets, but still using that SSL security uh, exchange, certificate exchange to provide security in the communication and the transmission of, of data and so forth, which is why I think banks are liking the way that this uh, performs um, as are many other services, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Okay, my screen is covered up, so I have no idea what this slide is. What is this? Oh, yeah, a lot of people will say, so it sounds like it's a lot like Skype. Well, the truth is it's like Skype, but it's not like Skype. In fact, it's nothing like Skype because Skype is an application that is something you have to install on a computer or a smartphone, whereas WebRT, a WebRTC is a technology that is built into common web browsers. Um, with Skype, it has to be on the device unless you use Skype for web, which uh, coincidentally is based on WebRTC. So Skype for web is actually a WebRTC app that's built in for web use if you don't wanna put that application on your device. And again, WebRTC is built into common web browsers such as Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, Apple Safari, Microsoft Edge, et cetera. Skype is owned by Microsoft, whereas WebRTC is completely open source. And I could talk about the reasons why I'm so angered by Skype and Microsoft, um, but um, it's really not worth going into. Um, give me a beer sometime, we'll go into it, and I'll just spew all my vitriol, uh, not in an open format like this. All right, so Skype requires that the user has to be registered on the app and you have to be able to find them in the directory. And some people say it needs to be as simple as Skype. I don't find Skype to be that simple, 
because you do have to log into account and register. You have to be found in the directory and all that. WebRTC is as simple as just a little URL link. You click on it and you're basically in the application almost immediately. Even though Skype is really well engineered, it has good audio algorithms, good uh, video algorithms. It's really not friendly for integration. Whereas with WebRTC, you do have that nice API. It's relatively simple to develop an app or have one developed for you and integrate it into a website. Uh, plus you have the ability to connect to 7 billion endpoints. So as long as someone isn't using Internet Explorer uh, 7, um, it, there's a good chance you're going to be able to connect to them and do a video call or do a voice call or do some text messaging back and forth. Um, and again, Skype uh, uses for audio Silk, which is kind of bandwidth limited at seven kilohertz for voice, whereas WebRTC uses an algorithm called Opus. And Opus is a nice and interesting algorithm, um, mainly because uh, it's a hybrid uh, between a couple of algorithms that you may have heard of. Um, and in fact, Opus is very much like a Reese's peanut butter cup in that, it, in that it's two great tastes that taste great together. So first of all, it uses the Silk algorithm from Skype, and then it uses another algorithm called CELT. And it's actually a hybrid algorithm that measures the um, audio content coming into the encoder, and it can determine whether it's going to use the lower bit rate um, lower quality voice algorithm with Silk, or if it's going to use the higher um, uh, bit rate, more uh, sophisticated algorithm um, for music called CELT, or it can actually use both of them. So it's actually a very nice open source algorithm. Um, and we've deployed almost the entire family of Opus constant bit rate and variable bit rate algorithms in our products uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, this little uh, graph will kind of show you why we kind of like Opus. Um, the biggest reason that is that it fits into a wide range of bit rates. So as low as eight uh, kilobits per second, all the way up to 128 kilobits per second. It fits a full dynamic range of applications. So it could be narrow band all the way up to full bandwidth stereo. So it has the ability to do 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz frequency response encoding. Uh, it sounds pretty darn good. Probably one of the most attractive things about it, in, in addition to it being open source, is that there are no licensing fees on it. Free is good, especially when it's done well and supported by companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, Zeif, so forth. Uh, we do love the AAC family of algorithms. Um, we've, we license those encoders and include those in um, our audio and video products for, for audio encoding. And we think they're really, really great. They sound great. Um, but there, the, there's something attractive about the fact that you have that Opus algorithm that kind of ranges the whole spectrum of bit rates and, and quality. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we're seeing more and more uh, IP audio codec manufacturers and, uh, of course, web browser manufacturers adding Opus to applications. So Opus is kind of like the hot new coding algorithm these days. So if you look at all of the web browsers that have deployed WebRTC technology for audio, video, and um, data transfer, it's all the majors. You've got uh, Microsoft and Chrome and uh, Google Chrome, as well Firefox, Safari, Opera, Vivaldi, some more obscure ones like Puffin and some others. Um, interesting to note that um, Microsoft Internet Explorer has been depreciated or will be fully depreciated in favor of Microsoft edge. Um, they made the decision not to continue to support Internet Explorer because they found that Edge was a much more efficient browser. Uh, it didn't take two and a half minutes to open the browser anymore, um, but it was just a much better platform on which to build and one that was um, really aimed at supporting HTML5 applications. So um, pretty wise move on the part of Microsoft. Um, there are a bunch of mobile applications that are using this as well, or mobile operating systems. Um, the one thing that we don't have on there is the uh, Ericsson, um, uh, maybe that's Tizen, I can't remember. But you can see there are a bunch of mobile applications and mobile, uh, mobile OSs that are supporting WebRTC. 
if you think about all of the applications that can be used and support uh, WebRTC, it's for things like online education. My daughter spent most of last year staring at a computer screen um, for you know her in-person, well, I mean, her live classes because they weren't allowed in the schools. And I'm sure many of you have uh, grandchildren and children that are in the same boat. Uh, but for telemedicine as well, a lot of doctor's visits took place using WebRTC-based um, video conferences with doctors, online gaming, and a lot of our smart speakers are actually using WebRTC already in the applications. Um, there are a ton of applications that we use every day to communicate with our customers and friends and family, whether it's Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, as long as their server hasn't been hacked and isn't down, Snapchat, Discord, Twitch. Um, there's a platform developed by Verizon called BlueJeans, which is a completely WebRTC application, GoToMeeting. All of these applications are WebRTC based or are using aspects of WebRTC um, for daily communication between friends, family, customers, et cetera. Um, and then on the broadcast side, there is an ever expanding list of applications that support WebRTC are, or are WebRTC based. IPDTL is very popular in the voiceover community for uh, doing live voiceovers, as is Source Elements, Source Connect Now. Uh, Clean Feed is one that a lot of broadcasters have been using. And uh, there are others, including one that I've just discovered. Um, there's an automation system out of the UK called Playout One that uses WebRTC uh, for its voice tracking application, which works very, very well. And then you have a whole range of uh, market segments that are depending on this, um, whether it's marketing, advertising, technical support, as I've done for our customers on our website, uh, and even back office communications. I have a, an implementation of free PBX uh, running here in my house. Um, back when we had the, the Georgia elections uh, last year, we're getting, we were getting so many phone calls. It was probably 14 phone calls a day ringing in on the home phone. So I basically decided to put a free PBX in front of it and any call that came in, they'd have to dial a three digit code to get to my phone. Um, and it saved my sanity and my family's sanity tremendously. So I didn't have to listen to um, Purdue and um, that other lady that were calling for our vote. It was, it was maddening, but um, it's actually come in very handy. Anyway, the, the whole reason I'm mentioning free PBX is that there's actually a module for WebRTC. The implication being that you can actually take in a call through your free PBX, have it come to your computer, and actually transfer it to somebody else's computer um, in your uh, back office environment. Or you can even talk between people or even text or exchange messages or data uh, within your back office system. So WebRTC is actually finding a lot of different applications um, for social networking, financial services, surveillance, live broadcasts, et cetera. So um, it's one of these uh, technologies that has really found a footing and it's taking off in a bunch of different areas. So if anything this past year has taught us is that, um, you know, finding ways to communicate from home um, and the tools to use them, um, they're there and you just have to basically adopt some best practices to get them to work well. And it's been interesting to find out how good is good enough, even for national broadcast media, where they're taking Zoom calls in, um, and there are some things about Zoom that leave a lot to be desired where audio is concerned, even though the video might be good. Um, and Skype and WhatsApp and Microsoft Teams are, are no different. Probably one of the biggest challenges is um, making sure that you have good audio content to get through. And so we make a lot of recommendations to our customers if they're going to be deploying these for use on air. We recommend that you first find a way to turn off the automatic gain control. And if you're using voice, turn off the video, get rid of an echo cancellation, use a decent headset. And I've got like three or four different headsets that I could use, but I also have a nice uh, Audio-Technica shotgun microphone here. So hopefully that's coming through okay. Um, and do some things like turn off other streaming applications on the network while you're doing the call. Um, make sure that you have provided a, um, 
uh, some kind of QoS on your network so you get the best effort for the data connection to um, your application. Make sure that you're using something with a very super simple interface um, and have dedicated hardware or server because you want to make sure that whatever you're doing to provide content on a live broadcast program has the best chance of working by utilizing things that are gonna be um, kind of, excuse me, foolproof, idiot proof, including educating the user and making sure that they have realistic expectations how it's gonna work. Um, even though you can use WebRTC applications on a smartphone, a lot of times users think that they can just use 4G while they're blowing down the highway and using earbuds, that's not necessarily gonna result in a really good experience for your listeners or for your host who's trying to do it. Also making sure that they know how to um, click on a link, connect to the, uh, to the program, um, and even practicing so, and so forth. Probably the most important thing that we tell our customers is to make sure that you adhere to the, um, the axiom of garbage in, garbage out. Because if you're going to use the speaker on your computer, or I'm sorry, the microphone on your computer, it's gonna sound like you're talking in the mouth of a cave through a tunnel with a cardboard box over your head. And that's not really a good thing. So making sure you have a dedicated microphone, headphones, or a headset is always a great idea. For example, the guy in the upper left-hand corner, he's got a nice pair of blue headphones and a, a blue USB mic. We highly approve of that scenario. The ladies in the upper right-hand corner, um, they've got some nice AKG broadcast headsets. There's really a good chance that they're using a nice USB interface like a Focusrite Scarlet or a uh, Yellow Tech Puck with a mic pre on a USB uh, interface that'll plug into the computer. We highly approve of that scenario. Um, the young lady in the lower right hand corner, she's got some uh, prosumery headphones on. It looks like a USB microphone of some kind. She really cares enough about the audio to isolate um, uh, the return audio so it's not gonna feed back through the microphone. That's an application we highly approve of. Um, the guy in the middle there that has the earbuds, you know, that's kind of marginal. If, if you have to, that will work just fine. But the guy in the lower left-hand corner using a cell phone and talking on speakerphone and thinking that that's going to sound good on the air, that's never a good idea. And we discourage that by all means. Um, I know that when I'm talking to someone and they're on speakerphone, um, I keep, if I can't understand them, I will keep on telling them I can't understand them until hopefully they pick up. Because when I'm talking with someone, I expect to have clear um, and concise communication when we're going back and forth. Okay. So that leads us to the what's next of WebRTC. Uh, so we're seeing that there are so many um, uh, WebRTC applications embedded into web browsers and so forth. Um, but more and more, we're seeing that um, broadcast tools and things that are being manufactured for the broadcast industry are becoming more software as a service, uh, media as a service, internet as a service, platform as a service, whatever as a service. So I think that we're gonna see more and more uh, service-based applications um, that are designed for broadcasters um, by the broadcast manufacturing companies. And in fact, um, on Monday, the 18th, after the SBE um, Web Extra um, presentation with uh, uh, newly elected President Andrew Kumis, um, we're going to be doing something in New York at 5 p.m. with uh, New York SBE Chapter 15. And Comrex will be introducing a few new products. And some of my fellow vendors on the uh, Next Best Thing Tour will be there. Um, to talk about some things that they are offering as well. It's a great opportunity for us because we haven't had um, trade shows and we have no NAB this year. So we're basically going to create a virtual uh, experience so you can come and find out what's new from some of the folks on the, uh, the Next Best Thing Tour. And I can provide a link for that. Um, Mr. Conrad Troutman of Cumulus uh, has provided us with access to his uh, webinar platform. So we can have up to 500 people attending and um, 
you know, seeing what's going on in New York. If you're in the New York area, David Bialik, um, you can come to the SBE picnic uh, in person. It's at uh, the Lindbrook Elks Lodge, the first, the number one Elks Lodge uh, in the country. And uh, we're gonna be there from five to seven with products uh, and fellow SBE members and any other broadcasters that wanna stop by. I'm already registered, Chris. Excellent. Then I won't have to come and find you. You have to register beforehand, by the way, if you're going. Yeah, because we're going to be providing food, which we usually don't do at these stops. But we're told that at that time of day, New York broadcast engineers get really unpleasant and hangry if you don't feed them. So if you're going to be coming by, register so we know how much food to have. That would be great. So um, last thing I'll talk about today, because it's something that I'm constantly asked about, and it kind of plays into, you know, the whole data infrastructure of, of this um, communications thing we're dealing with these days. 5G, we're seeing all these garbage pails on telephone poles popping up all over the place, including in cactus and uh, in neighborhoods and on buildings and so forth. Um, People have asked me time and time again, is Comrex 5G ready? And my common refrain is that 5G isn't even 5G ready. Um, I think the common expectation is because since the uh, cell providers are advertising it, it must be ready for prime time. Well, if you remember back to the days of 4G, 4G wasn't really 4G, it was like 3.25G and then eventually it was 3.5G. It wasn't until like just the past few years they've actually fully realized the full specification to include things like voice over LTE uh, for um, uh, AMR wideband communications between um, uh, mobile devices. So 5G right now, when we see all these little microcell devices that are popping up, you'll notice that they're in uh, crowded and congested areas downtown, around convention centers, around shopping malls. Primarily what they're doing is they're using that millimeter wave technology primarily for voice. Um, and they're putting them pretty close together because they're operating in the 30 gig to 300 gigahertz uh, millimeter wave band. And there's not a whole lot of signal propagation and it does require that they're fairly close together in order to interoperate and mesh together um, just primarily for the, the way they're designed. Um, in terms of data, uh, we're not really going to see a fully realized specification of the um, 5G specification completed until 2024, and then it will probably roll out um, in the years following that. So we don't have any uh, 5G modems. They haven't been provided to us by our vendors yet, and we're kind of waiting to find out how the technology fully deploys and how it's fully specified. Um, before we can even offer anything. Right now as it is, they're basically load, load, um, um, offloading all of the data traffic from that 5G millimeter waveband stuff down to the existing 4G LTE network. Kind of makes sense that um, T-Mobile a few years ago, it's been about 10 years now, bought all that 600 megahertz um, space, knowing that they were gonna be using that for data primarily. Um, as part of the 5G uh, packaging that they were going to be introducing. So there you have it. Um, that's my little talk on, on um, WebRTC technology. Um, we're excited to be able to introduce some new things on Monday. So if you have a chance, uh, come by and take a look. And in the meantime, I'm going to stop sharing this portion, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. We have a question from the YouTube uh, streaming uh, viewers. He asks, how would you compare the reliability to something like FieldTap? Well, FieldTap is a straight SIP app, and there aren't really mechanisms for reliability. Basically, it's just sending UDP packets from point to point. Um, the technology that is uh, built into WebRTC does provide some dynamic buffering. It does have some error concealment and protection techniques. Um, so it's slightly different because um, instead of it just sending audio that's digitized and compressed and sent as a SIP stream across the network. Uh, there's actually some back and forth between the web browsers and that um, intermediary web RTC server. Um, I would say that using um, a web RTC application like our Opal or 
the thing that cannot be named at this time, um, it's going to be, I would say, a step up in reliability over um, our field tap app or other SIP apps, um, but not as not nearly as reliable as our, our heavyweight um, access and BrickLink technology that use our cross-lock reliability layer. Sounds like we got you a week or so too early. Just a few days. I mean, we'll be talking about this uh, on Monday. Well, we'll have to do that and then bring you back. Anyone else have a question for Chris on WebRTC or actually any of the Comrex program, the uh, applications and products? Yeah, that's Harold with question. So is um, um, Opus uh, encoding uh, generally available for use? Uh, perhaps if you have just a bunch of audio files you want to stream as opposed to real time, can you just encode them as Opus and let people have the quality of that? Well, um, as I mentioned, it is an open source project and those libraries are available for download. Um, there's no licensing fees on them. So as long as you have uh, some kind of encoding device that has those libraries in them, yes, you can encode an Opus and transmit royalty-free and decode as well. Very good. And then uh, WebRTC, is it um, UDP in each direction, perhaps with um, forward error correction and stuff like that and dealing with last, lost packets? Uh, I don't believe that they deploy anything like automatic repeat request or ARQ. Um, the whole idea is to keep this as low latency as possible, but it is, uh, there are some error protection concealment techniques, um, dynamic buffering and so forth. I'm not exactly how in, sure how intense the uh, retransmission gets if packets are lost, um, but that's all part of the, the audio engine, as it were. Um, and again, that's part of the, the built-in technology. And it's relatively new. I mean, it first kind of um, saw the light of day in 2013 as a working product. And the specification is constantly being refined and improved. I have heard that there is some talk in some of the standards uh, meetings about adding SRT to it, which could make it absolutely huge. So we'll have to find out. Yeah, thank you. The uh, the thing of uh, uh, retransmission and so on, of course, would really kill uh, the, the latency. Um, seems like small packets and forward error correction can still deal with some of the loss, but thank you. Yeah, and I can say that our cross-lock uh, reliability layer does provide that retransmission of packets um, utilizing ARQ, and we have this ability to uh, temporarily add a little bit of buffering um, just for a certain period of time to retransmit those specific packets and then just allow it to ramp back down to low latency again. So it, it really requires a lot more than I think what the web browsers are capable of. It would require something like SRT in order for that to happen. A follow-up question from the uh, YouTube uh, viewer. A follow-up, uh, what is the bi-rect bi-directional latency uh, on WebRTC? Um, in most cases, it's less than half of a second, um, but a lot of that's going to depend on last mile connectivity. Um, it's better than some SIP phone calls I've noticed on our, on our product. Um, it's less than a half of a second. Um, you definitely have to have a mix minus um, on our device, but getting rid of like a third party server um, which is kind of the purpose of our Opal device. Instead of having a server in the middle, our Opal box is actually the server. And it's also the web browser on the receive side back in the studio. So it kind of takes the, takes the middleman out of the equation, if you will. But latency is generally fairly low unless you have a lot of contention on the network. And then you have to go back and address those issues by making sure you're prioritizing the application on the network with, uh, um, you know, QoS on your router and so forth. So I'm gonna share this. So um, you'll notice that in the uh, URL window where it says quincyopal.tk, this is a URL that a guest would get. 
and they would just click on that and it opens up this landing page. And within the landing page, you would select um, your audio device for speakers or headphones and then your microphone device. And you would never wanna use the internal microphone on your PC, you'd wanna use um, the USB driver or you know a good headset. And then once you've got that, you just hit the connect button and you're doing audio back and forth. And in this case, I'm connecting to uh, my colleague Raul Hunt's um, device in Quincy, Illinois, which is uh, Raul does Latin America and Canada for us. So it's a real simple interface. Now, on the um, back office side, let me just go back into the configuration page. And to get to it, just like on most of our products, you can type in the URL or the IP address forward slash CFG. And it will give you a little splash screen for login. And there we go. I'm going to type in my super secret um, username and password. And then essentially you've got um, your system behavior screen where you can set up um, various aspects of how the device will perform. Um, you can mess around with uh, the networking settings, uh, the certificate uh, source and, and call information, um, port information as well. And this is the important part right here. This is where you create an invite. So let's say I want Barry to be a guest on my Opal call. Um, this creates a unique link and I'm going to go and put Barry's name in there, BDR, BDR. And I can also specify whether they're going to call in on channel one or channel two or the first available. And let's just say channel two and I'll save it. Then I can copy that invite link by hitting that button and I can paste that into an email uh, or a text. And then I can send that off and then once Barry opens that up or just clicks on it in the email, it will open up the default web browser. And look at that. I now have um, my connection link that I saw before. I will select my uh, audio input source or audio output source and audio input source, and then hit connect and I'm doing the conference. Now you'll notice this is a different splash screen. Opal has two discrete um, audio channels for bi-directional communication. You can also change the logo for each channel as well. So the first one was uh, Radio Mirai. This is uh, Castell Communications. And that way you can basically send them to two different locations if you want. But it's a very simple process, um, but it does require that you have um, a static IP address and a domain whose CNAME record you can forward to that IP address. Um, but once you own it, there's really no ongoing costs and it's a very nice service to have. And then you can also, um, uh, let's see here, there is a control page that a producer can use so that once you're done with the call, you can drop the call or, or drop the call and disable the invite, which means that that person cannot use that link anymore to connect into you which is good for an occasional guest or just a, a one-time guest. So that's kind of the little tour of Opal. And Opal just needs the one box at one end? That's correct. So you're using a web browser on the remote side or the guest side, and then the Opal box, which is still in my luggage, which I would be happy to show you, but I'd have to run upstairs. It's, it's the size of a BrickLink 2, and it's got two analog inputs, uh, two analog outputs, or an AES in and out, um, and an ethernet jack. And it's a silver front. Piece. And a silver front, yep. Yeah. Hey, Chris, uh, um, is it uh, port specific or is it running off of port 80? There are a number of ports that have to be uh, dealt with. And what we typically tell people, and it's very unpopular to, to request, is to put it on uh, a public facing static IP address, mainly because there's a range of ports that have to be active in order for it to work. 
So port 443 has to be open, especially if it's behind a net or firewall, you've got to forward a, a range of ports. Uh, so communication, I think, is happening. I, I'd have to go back and look at the ports. I was going to get them tattooed on the inside of my arm, but my wife disapproved. It would make my life so much easier if I had them. Um, I have no tattoos, by the way. But happy wife, happy life. Really impressive. It, uh, they have all, all their guests on um, the Opal. The, the producer will send out um, headset uh, microphone for them to plug into their computer and send them the link. And, uh, you know, they have callers on the phone. You can tell the difference between caller and the host, but it, a lot of the times you can't tell much of a difference. Well, I can hear it if I'm listening for it, but the host and the guests sound like they're in the same room with the Opal. It's, you know, very uh, nice box and not too expensive. Yeah, and if you use something like this Sennheiser headset, which I think cost me $70, there's a cost headset that we kind of like, which costs $50 to send out to a guest. It sounds pretty good. But, you know, I've done some demos for people where I've got a, uh, you know, I've got an RE20 on my Yellow Tech uh, Mica mic arm over here. And then I use a Yellow Tech Puck mic pre that has the leveling engine in it. And it sounds like I'm in a broadcast studio. Um, and it can, because it's using that Opus coding algorithm that's got that really um, good frequency response and really good um, uh, bit rate capability. I think it starts at like 128 kilobits and then can scale down based on the bandwidth availability to like 96 or 48 kilobits, depending on uh, what it decides. Does the software expand so that you could have more than two callers? Uh, no, it's basically a two input, two output device. But if you visit me on Monday at 5 p.m., I may have something exciting for you to learn about. <laughs> What if you can't get a fixed IP address? Any good ideas? Is there, work, is there a workaround? You can join me on Monday, and I have a great idea for you. I will look forward to it. And it's really kind of one of the things that we've found. I mean, especially in a corporate environment, asking someone to put an appliance on a network on a static IP address that's publicly facing with all of these ports, which are just like danger, danger, danger. It's not a really popular idea with the IT professionals. Um, and so this new thing that we're gonna talk about on Monday alleviates a lot of that uh, heartburn for uh, corporations and IT departments, in theory. Have you got someone writing convincing instructions for the IT guys? <laughs> Well, that's usually one of the very first things that we do. So all of our products have uh, a little thing that we include called info for IT managers, which basically has all of the, the ports that have to be open and the services that are used, because um, those are the questions that they will ask. And so we've got that for Opal already. If you uh, go to the back of the BrickLink or Access Manual, you'll see that in there too. Um, and usually if somebody asks me, I have to crack open the manual because I can never remember all of the ports for Opal, but the ones for Access and BrickLink and our um, live shot IP video codec are fairly simple. I've got four BrickLinks in use and I love those things. I am inclined to um, love them as well because I have a daughter that's going to be going to college in about a year and a half. So and they're a good product for us. Well, we've reached, reached the top of the hour here, so I'll at least uh, mention that for those that have to get on to other activities, but we're not chasing you away, Chris. We certainly want to thank you for your presentation and for being here.